I V M. to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travellers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hi guys, welcome to a brand new episode on the Musafir Stories. Before we get on with today's episode, a quick shout out to some of our listeners who took time to reach out to us, Siraj and Sashovit. Thank you so much guys for your kind words. Also, a quick shout out to Hina for a very frank feedback that uh, sometimes we as hosts tend to talk a little more than we should be talking. Thank you, Hina. We will keep this in mind going forward. A big announcement to all the podcast fans in Bangalore. As a part of International Podcast Day celebrations, we as a part of Autopod Collective are co-hosting a meetup with Hubhopper for all podcast enthusiasts and podcasters. The date is September 28th. The link for registration and um, other information is in the show notes. Make sure to register and be there. And yeah, it is free. So come by. Now finally, as for today's episode, we talk to a man of many words and many languages. Let's jump into the conversation and find out more. So with that introduction, I'd like to welcome Sudarshan SN, a polyglot, a polymath, uh, ethnologist, linguist, uh, I don't know, I'm running out of words now to uh, describe the guest we have on our show today. Sudarshan, thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir Stories and welcome to the podcast. Hi Sudarshan, welcome to the Musafir Stories. Thank you so much Saif and Faiza. You you guys are doing a wonderful story. You've been very kind to me Saif, you're calling me all that. I'm, I'm just a simple guy trying to explore the world, that's it. <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> not. Being too humble, yeah. Um, we've given a little, I think, a very, very concise and uh, brief introduction about you. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us and our listeners a little bit more about um, you, Sudarshan. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Sudarshan. And, and uh, I am, I was just another regular run-of-the-mill guy, uh, you know, proud of uh, Chennai society. So uh, to talk about myself, I started off as an engineer, as a software engineer. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I kind of realized that my calling was much deeper in a, in a different sense. Okay. Because by the time I was in my eighth grade or something, I kind of was able to speak, read and write in about four or five languages, which which is something I had learned in one of my summer vacations, actually. No, wonderful. Okay. And and that's how I learned uh, Kannada, actually. And that's how I started learning Kannada as well. I, in the sense, I kind of realized I wanted to do something more. So I, I ended up, uh, I quit my job and then did degrees in linguistics. And I also got myself uh, an English teaching degree uh, from Canada. And the linguistics degree kind of opened my uh, world up to a world within, you know, the, within our own world. Because mm-hmm. there's so much, so there's so much of layers and layers of languages, cultures, and like color, the beauty of it. It's just amazing. And, and the best part is not, even though I had this urge in me, what, what, what the degree has done is kind of opened me up to the whole world, actually, because uh, that's kind of how it is overall. I speak in about 13 languages. I read mm-hmm. and write more than I read and write in more than 15 of them actually. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and about six or, six or seven of them with like first language proficiency. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> really, really good. Like I can just switch effortlessly to between these two. And I kind of uh, also am I'm uh, you know I I I've, I've been learning music since I was a kid. Uh-huh. And, and I I run a you know YouTube channel called Indic Living. I N D I C Living. Mm-hmm. I have a small request, Sudarshan. Yeah. Can you say like one sentence in at least like two or three languages, like a mixture, please? <laughs> I would love to hear something like no, that. I can already watch for it, but yeah, just for the sake of the listeners. <laughs> no, it's just yeah. fascinating to listen to it. Yeah, it will be like perfect for the podcast because. Uh, welcome to the Musafir stories. Venuna Tamil Pesalam, Tamil and the Musafir stories, Ulana Varakum, Englode, Manamana Vanakangal. And welcome to Muzafir Stories. Welcome to Muzafir Stories. 
Bienvenue à tous les oh. pour à tous les mots à Musafir Stories. Oh my God. Nous sommes ici à Musafir Stories. De propos à la vache à pas Musafir Stories. Okay, I think I've just, just gone blank. Out, yeah. What was that? Russian? Last one? What was that? That was that was Russian. Wonderful. Wonderful. It feels Wonderful. awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we should do a podcast separately of just talking about languages. But today here, we're here to talk about uh, your trust with travel. So we want to learn a little bit more about that and how you've been um, traveling for, for a while now. And uh, before this was and this even became like uh, social media cool, right? To travel. Uh, you've been traveling even before that. So uh, we want to t- touch upon one of your journeys Um that you did a while ago and uh, uh, why don't you tell us and the listeners a little bit more about uh, where you're taking us to today Sudarshan uh, I, the first thing I'm going to tell you is when I'm taking you to because uh, this is right after when internet came to India uh-huh. that was in 1998 uh-huh. okay. and, and so I mean even by the time it was 2000 there was no smartphones there was no internet there was no google maps and all that stuff Mm-hmm. I mean, they, there was, but it was not used as much as it is used right now. I can actually make a video call to anybody in the whole universe right now. But I'm back then in 2002, we were talking about like dial-up speeds and all that stuff, right? <laughs> so uh, one of my, my first glimpse and my, my first understanding of uh, Dhanush Kodi, mm-hmm. let me just first get the context of Dhanush Kodi. Yeah. Dhanush Kodi is actually uh, the southeasternmost tip of India in, 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 in the sense that the southernmost tip is, I mean, southernmost tip of mainland India is Kanyakumari. Right. right. And there is another island off the coast of Tamil Nadu which is called Rameshwaram Island. Mm-hmm. So Rameshwaram Island is kind of famous for two primary things. One is for Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, the former president of India. And it's also uh, famous for the Pamban Bridge. Sure. Which is right. uh, what? Which is one of the first, uh, which is one of the first of its kind. It was built back in the seventies. No, mm-hmm. not seventies. Wait, I think it was built in the nineteen fourteen. I think, yeah, nineteen fourteen. It was built while the British were still here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The railway bridge was built back then, but then of course another magnificent road bridge kind of uh, has come up. It's kind of like about three times the size of the rail. Yeah, and uh, just to give our listeners a little bit of a reference, it's the same bridge. Um, which is covered on uh, the movie Chennai Express where Shah Rukh and Deepika actually drive where they drive to Rameshwaram. Uh, I know it's not uh, uh, entirely in the same league but uh, yeah, just to kind of give our listeners a little bit of a reference. What, what you're saying is right. It was it was first off, it was CGI. It was uh, Red Chili's uh, entertainment. But <laughs> they, they actually had, they actually had uh, one of those making of the movies thing. But yeah, you're talking about the right thing. And uh, the, I, I'll tell you uh, one more context. is like, it's the end because... It's on the maritime border with Sri Lanka. So the border between Sri Lanka and India is made of uh, what is called the Ram Setu, the Adams Bridge. Yep. Right. And, and, and it's called the Adams Bridge because it was named by the British, you know, just about 100 years ago. But it's been worshipped and revered as Ram Setu for several thousands of years. Right. Sure. And it's it's very interesting that just, just about two, three years ago, NASA officially actually confirmed that that bridge was actually man-made and it could not have been anything else. When I say bridge, don't really picture a cantilever bridge or something like the concrete bridge. Mm-hmm. It's a bridge in which people could walk from this side of the this side of the shore to the other side of the shore. And it consists of essentially just like low-lying... Uh, it's called a tombolo. It's, in geography, it's called a tombolo. Mm, okay. But but as such, that's the edge, that's the edge of India. And, and uh, I mean, you can't go further than that. And it's 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 kind of one of those places which is head which was heavily monitored by the Coast Guard and by by the Indian Navy uh, mm. because of a lot of uh, you know migration on both sides. People were kind of escaping the civil war that was going on in Sri Lanka. Right. Okay. See, they would literally either walk or hop on one of those small little dingy one of those dingy boats and either actually end up in accidents or kind of end up being rescued by the Coast Guard. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. I think we have set up the context uh, really well, both from a geographical perspective and um, we've added, um, like, sprinkled it with a little bit of history as well, which we'll uh, delve upon more as we, as we speak about the place. But, uh, yeah, take it away, uh, Sudarshan. Give us uh, an insight into your trip. And as you said, this is like... Um, Back back in the day when um, you had to do like a lot of work uh, to plan a trip, right? We didn't have like technology at our fingertips to do most of the things for us. So um, yeah, that way. And, like, and, and uh, so my my first trust with uh, Danish Kodi kind of uh, started in my, my childhood when I heard stories about Ramayana 
and uh, you know my, my because i because as as a child my family would typically spend time you know going over to you know different pilgrimage tours and different places and i i heard the word dhanush kodi i i'll, I'll give you one more context about what mm-hmm. it was back then see the, the island of rameshwaram is about uh, 50 kilometers wide and and, and so the, at about about 75% the three fourths of the island had mm-hmm. road access back then and past a certain point there was no road road access you either had to one 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 high, either had to walk or go on one of those uh, one of those fish trawlers mm-hmm. which basically did the whole you know the job of uh, taking curious tourists like me or people who just wanted to visit from this spot wherever it is to the other end that's the, the end of uh, as in you know i wouldn't use the word dead end but yeah the kaldasak the kaldasak of india mm-hmm. It, it's just a point of no return for India, right? So they would just take them over, spend about uh, you know half an hour, fifteen minutes, and charge them for three, charge them like three hundred, four hundred, which is a lot of money back then, by the way. In two thousand two, when I was in my second year of engineering, I made my first trip to Dhanushkodi independently. Okay. So I I just took a train and said, you know what? I I just had a backpack and I said, you know what? I'm just going to go there. So the first part of the journey involved going over, going over all the way to like uh, Ramanathapuram. Ramanathapuram is like going to Tirchi, right. and there was a there was a direct train from Tirchi to uh, Rameshwaram, mm-hmm. and that was one of the first times I I got to actually cross uh, you know the Pamban Bridge by train. It it was a it was a beautiful sight. I mean, imagine you're like you're like in the middle of it's like it's like a train bridge across the sea. Sure. It's a few kilometers long, yeah. and the train makes it a point to kind of go slow because the bridge is, you know, kind of like old. Mm-hmm. So it it takes about a whole ten, ten, fifteen, ten, eleven minutes for the bridge to cross from one end of the bridge to the other. Yeah, and I'm in completely. I'm like, oh my goodness, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I, obviously, so see back then because it's 2002, one digital cameras are kind of started coming in only around you know around that time 2001 2002 the, the common market consumer market mm-hmm. so what i had was essentially minolta camera with the konica film roll <laughs> <laughs> and the konica film roll i'm sure the the audience and uh, saif and faiza you you might have heard of the konica film roll right <laughs> sure, used nostalgia. it also <laughs> nostalgia 20, 20 see, see you 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 had to kind of measure your photos you understand yeah, right because right. it was like 24 or 36 yeah and you miss that <laughs> you, know, you you see you, and see i was i was in my first year so and each roll costed about 120 130 rupees that was quite right. a lot of money back then right right and <laughs> even like getting the, it printed afterwards oh yeah that was i had a minolta camera which is a point and shoot uh, click camera so So I had 36 photos of Danish Kodi from that trip. Oh. I I know for the very simple reason that I didn't have backup rolls and I didn't have a gear. I just had a point and shoot Minolta camera in my in my pocket and there yeah. was a backpack yeah. and and that, that's about it. Yeah. So I go in there I kind of you know just make friends with some of the people and kind of get along with all of them and uh, you know I I even managed to end up you know staying there in one of the you know the, the fisherman huts for about 3 4 days mm. no they were so gracious and they were so amazing mm-hmm. because they, i'm i'm talking about like you know the beach beach sand that that was the floor yeah. and they have a small tapadi kind of a thing and i you know the tapadi and then like fishing nets and everything i even got to like it's called dragging nets it's 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 a it's a thing mm-hmm. what happens uh, is that when when the fishermen who don't have do not really have like you know huge advanced like launch it's called a launch fishing launch mm-hmm. like steam boat and all that what they do is they manually go around and make a big net around that place and all the fishermen in the village come along and actually drag mm-hmm. that drag that net oh and i promise you it's it's super heavy it's in the sea it's a whole nest net, net cast out in the right. sea and a whole village of people are kind of like just dragging it along to the shore so i got to be in that i even got to be in that ceremony so i i i do all that and and in danish kodi it's a very interesting thing because see danish kodi was a very it is very it was a very important town all the way until 1964 i will tell you two reasons if i were in chennai or bangalore i say chennai actually huh? i could take a train directly from chennai to colombo sri lanka can you believe that <laughs> yeah not not at this point yeah no i know i'll tell you i'll tell you what the route is uh, bo- there was a train called as boat mail b o a boat mail boat mail went from chennai all the way to danishkodi okay 
and Danish Kodi, you get off that specific spot, which is a pier on the sea. Mm-hmm. You get off the train. You you just get on a ship, which is basically waiting on the other side of the gully, which is and the other side of the platform is the actual sea. Oh. And there was something called INS Ramanujam, Indian naval ship Ramanujam. That ship would take any uh, the passenger from Danish Kodi to Talai Mannar, which was the other side of the Park Straits, mm-hmm. the Park Bay actually, the Park Bay across the islands, and we would get to Talai Mannar. And from Talai Mannar, one could take a sh- one could take a train and get all the way to Colombo. So if you think about it, if you start now, I would be in Colombo in 24 hours. No. <laughs> yeah. The most interesting part is there was no visa, there was no passport. There was none of that stuff. You just basically get on a train here and just go all the way to another country. That is how it was back then. That's true, and uh, I think in terms of uh, even in terms of the distance, right, between Dhanush Kodi to uh, Talai Mannar, I think it's under forty kilometers, right? Um, that's that's how close it is. Eighteen to twenty-two kilometers. Yes. Right. So that's how close it is, and um, yeah, this was the scene up until nineteen sixty-four. And uh, would you like to also brief our listeners a little bit about uh, the events of nineteen sixty-four and um, what what followed? Um, so, Sudarshan. What happened on on that fateful night of December twenty-second? So uh, this was the uh, cyclonic season here, mm-hmm. and as in it, it's it is still even now. I mean, the intensity of the storms have been much worse. So I, I, I'll give you a small little description of the town by itself. Mm-hmm. See, Danish Kodi is on an isthmus. It's kind of like a stri- narrow strip of land. Right. The narrow strip of land is about three to four kilometers wide, and you have the Park Bay on the other side, and then you have the Gulf of Mannar on the other side. Mm-hmm. And the third side is another. It's, it's another sea as well. That's another narrow strip of uh, small little spots of islands, but that's T C as well. What happened in, on on December twenty second, December twenty first, around that time? There was heavy rain, right. and on the December twenty second, what happened was the sea kind of on both sides caved in. Mm. So the, the 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 three four kilometers of the strip of land we're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, there was no more land. The, the seas on both sides kind of rose up because of a tidal wave or because of whatever it is, because of the cyclonic intensity, the waves and everything. And it kind of caved in on both sides and kind of dragged away people and property and everything. Yep. So what was left after '64? It was essentially the ruins of Danish Kodi. Yep. So we're not really talking about Danish Kodi as a town. We're talking about the ruins of Danish Kodi in which fishermen lived because they had to do their living, right? Right. Mm-hmm. They had to yep. do their living because I mean that that was that was that that region was rich in like you know fisheries, all kinds. At of... this point, I'd just like to touch. Um, so, in terms of the human inhabitation, right? Because um, you did touch upon this earlier, right? After the 1964 cyclone, pretty much everything was wiped out, right? Uh, after the Rameshwaram cyclone, uh, I think uh, until up until that point, it was uh, pretty much a bustling town with um, fishing as the main occupation, and they had like most of the amenities regular town would have, right? Right, a railway station, post office, a church, a exactly. temple. Exactly. They had temple. They had a mosque. They had a church. They had. But it was a regular town, regular coastal. Right. Town. Yeah, but since then, I think uh, that cyclone. It was so deadly that uh, I think the winds, even the wind speeds, right? They were uh, up about um, 270 kilometers an hour. That's how intense the cyclone was, and it pretty much wiped out everything, including a train that was um, ferrying passengers across from the mainland, right? You're, you're absolutely right, and and, and uh, you know, I mean, there was an actress called Savitri. Uh, and she was in one of the trains. Okay. And and uh, it's just that even now, as in celebrities were in the trains, they get more attention, right? So uh, so there was like a train service. Uh, you imagine the width of the train, and the whole whole section, the sea on both sides. Imagine a narrow strip of land about two three kilometers wide, and like a railway track, a lone railway track with a lone train walking in the middle. You know, kind of. And and when the sea is converged. They kind yeah. of washed away the train. See, as I was contemplating and understanding the magnitude of this incident mm-hmm. from all the locals there who were telling me, okay, this is what happened. This is what happened. The first thought that struck that struck my mind was, oh, this is oh my god, this is this is such a beautiful place. It's a place out of the universe. It's like right out of some kind of an imaginary story. Right. So that that's when the first thought came to my mind. What mm-hmm. if actually could I could change something? What if you know? What if you could change something about it? What if People could do something about it, okay. and, then, and and then I kind of I kind of went to the, Egmo, the archives in Egmore and in kind of did some research on what actually happened, and, and, and that's when I got my first inspiration to kind of write a, a novel. Okay, and the novel was called uh, novel is called Time in the Cyclone. 
uh, th- that is when I got the idea to kind of uh, write something about that place and and have this uh, plan this thought what if you could change something about the future what if you could go back in time and change something about this cyclone and that kind of had that very uh, it was it had a very deep significance for me uh, because see my mother passed away when i was 2 months old and, and and that was one of those things you know one of those things that it was one of those longings back then like what if i could save my mother kind of a thing my mother passed away in a fire accident mm-hmm. so as Sorry. a kid no no that, that's okay that's okay it's been it's been quite a while but the thing what if you could do something about it it mm-hmm. is one of those thoughts what if i could save my mother what if i could save things it was one of those heroic thoughts right and uh, and that that that's when i my my attention was focused on the city and what if i could save this uh, city mm-hmm. so then came the imaginary you know the, the the imaginary the fictitious account of how i went about doing that mm-hmm. that was my novel time in a cyclone and and see to, to cut a long story short the time the novel is about you know a, a very scientifically oriented guy genius level kind guy he find invents a time machine See, mm-hmm. time machine is only a plot device. It's not. I'm not really giving a description of what is a time machine and all that stuff. Uh-huh. The guy goes back in time, but then realizes that you know he couldn't really save or alter history because you know what, a lot of things were happening back then. The same kind mm-hmm. of things happening now. Then even now, in some mm-hmm. places, female infanticide, and realizes that a lot of evils were back then, going on back then. And he, the guy who just went back there in time to save this, you know, this, this, you know, these people there. ends up being uh, pinned as a thief and a robber by the people in 1964 and gets locked up in 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 a very tall building he he's there to warn the people that you know what hey guess what people get out of here there's a cyclone coming up your town is going to be wiped out and he gets locked up in a in an attic somewhere and he gets to watch the entire destruction of the town right in front of his eyes in like you know high definition he he kind of he saves a baby in 1964 he saves one baby and he kind of you know comes back to the present and kind of understands that you know he comes back 2004 and he's being treated by doctor and he's been treated by a lady doctor and he's like uh, what's your name and it turns out according to the story it turns out that's the baby he saved back in 1964 oh my god <laughs> <laughs> So I will I will be releasing that book very soon on Amazon Kindle and uh, you know other avenues. Mm. So just just wanted to do some fine tuning that. But but as far as far as the whole uh, town is concerned, yeah, you're right. As in it was abandoned, it was cut off from humanity most of you know as in mostly. Sure, and I see why why this topic is I think so dear to you as well, right? Because it's it's such a sad event and an event of that magnitude that literally wiped out that whole town that was there, and um, it was pretty much the town was declared as unfit for inhabitation, right? After that, it's only a handful of people, a handful of families that live there now. Um, it's pretty much a ghost town now. That's what it is. So uh, I think uh, one of the reasons might be that uh, just the way. it is located the location of the place right the location of the town dhanushkodi it's just that it's situated uh, like on a thin strip of land with sea on both sides and i think it's just prone to um, uh, events like this in the future maybe on this scale as well so that's why i think after the devastating cyclone of 1964 the government even went ahead and uh, declared this is unfit for um, inhabitation that might be a reason also why um, there hasn't be like um being a town that has been set up or uh, it's gone back to normal after that it's just the ghost town that remains and uh, i agree I, with you and i, I see I, i mean when i when i looked in retrospect i kind of realized that past 64 that's when the civil war in sri lanka started and, and danish kodi mm-hmm. and rameshwaram used to kind of be like hot spots for like you know like uh, as in people coming in from the other side and that's mm-hmm. one and people used to kind of like smuggle diesel petroleum and kerosene because sri lanka was like you know much in a much much more pathetic condition back in 60 60s and 70s and then it yeah. see, in long story short i don't think it made much economic sense for people back then safe i think i i think that was sure. that is my my understanding that it didn't make much economic sense for them to rebuild the town and mm-hmm. then there was a lot of money required and india was going through its own uh, revival and emergency kind of came in in the 70s and the dravidian parties kind of uh, you know became became the the dominant powers in tamil nadu and and uh, you know the national security issue all of that there was a, there was a whole a whole lot of factors i don't think we'll ever understand completely why that place was not rebuilt back 
right away because nowadays, sure. nowadays if something like that happens i think people would kind of pour in donations and contribute and kind of rebuild the whole place in about right, one right. month two months but i i think it's just been abandoned back then and the, the one thing they've done in the past three four years i think just constructed a road all the way to the end, edge of uh you know edge of that place with uh with you know with uh indian flag and that's mm-hmm. also the maritime border so i had the very uh i had the huge honor of actually going with the fishermen on fishing i was a vegetarian by the way <laughs> i still am <laughs> and they almost kind of went to the literal border because there was a board back then which said india there was a board which said india with a flag on it see because that that patch between danishkodi on the indian side and talai malar in sri lanka had 22 islands mm-hmm. and out of those 22 islands six of them belong to india and the other 16 belong to sri lanka you basically stop with six and you know because past that you you know if you if you go past that the sri lankan navy is going to mm-hmm. shoot you thinking that you're smuggling you're going over to sri lanka if you come back uh-huh. the indian navy is going to shoot you thinking you're smuggling <laughs> from that side so in in that sense it was one of the tricky situations and i i i went all the way to the literal maritime border and kind of got back and okay. and uh, just kind of uh, spent time with the fishermen immensely understanding the culture understanding the way they speak understanding the way they you know the look at life they the way they look at mm-hmm. you know everything and it, the most importantly the, the indian perseverance the the, the the biggest trait of indians we can persevere anywhere we we, we survive despite cyclones despite everything and their life their way of life was going on exactly as it was and see it's not with it's not that they earlier had like a three bhk apartments with a jacuzzi and a balcony right <laughs> they, they still had tapadis and they still had their homes where they had their catamaran catamarans to do fishing and they continue doing the same thing so i i'll tell you i have to tell you one or two more instances which which were magical uh, see yeah. imagine being in a place where there was no electricity there was no visible light bulb for another 18 kilometers the only light bulb you could see was the a doordarshan tower which was 19 20 21 kilometers on the other side I mean, that's that's in rameshwaram so mm-hmm. it is pitch darkness and when one is there at the edge of the indian maritime border you imagine there is zero lights everywhere but it's not zero lights because the whole place is actually lit by the stars and the moon you know and and and, mm-hmm. and, the, and the ships that are fishing trawlers that are distance at a distance about 10 15 kilometers on the sea so you kind of get a kind of feel a feel a oneness with the whole universe so you 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 kind of feel how minus one one kind of feels how minuscule one is when compared to the stretch of the universe because one is there and it's the edge of the maritime border and we've just created that as humans and Absolutely. when one is looking yeah. up all one sees is without borders without anything and just looking at the beautiful expanse of the sky and see that's the thing right as in when when one goes away from the city lights i mean as in we are used to bangalore chennai city lights and we don't actually get to see the sky one needs yeah. to go see the sky <laughs> one needs to go to the countryside when there's no electricity see now it's not really possible back in the day i got to see what it was to live in a place without electricity and got to see the skies with with stars all the way from one side of the horizon to the, the other side of the horizon and it almost felt like there was so many more stars than what one typically sees from you know the city skyline right yeah i i think i'll go ahead and call it like once in a lifetime experience right if, if i may add uh, six times in six times in a lifetime experience uh, safe and fair <laughs> <laughs> because i'm i was i was talking about my first trip my first trip was in 2002 and then i went back in 2003 and 2004 uh, that is when i completed my novel and on august 25th 2004 My novel uh, Time in a Cyclone was released by uh, Dr. Narayan Murthy of sure. Infosys the former uh, chairman of Infosys and the first copy was received by Nandan Nilakani this was the time of uh, the only thing that come up back then was blogs and internet apart from that there was none of these uh, snapchat you know whatsapp none of these things yeah and there was no concept of doing anything from the phone the phone was just essentially device to make calls and receive smss <laughs> so so and and this 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 is what happened back back then and so i went back again 2006 and then the last time i went there was in 2010 i i kind of went back to a setting where uh, the the kids i had I, i had seen in 2002 had grown up they were kind of like young adults who were like early 20s or late you know late teenagers and and i got to see the family 
I got it. I got to kind of interact with the Tata, as in the grandfather and the, and the grandmother. But I will definitely be, uh, you know, spending at least, you know, quite a quite a good chunk of my life just going back and just seeing what things are. Thank and, you uh, so much. It's been a really magical experience. I think like going to a place this maroon and it's still so beautiful. Thank you so much, Sudarshan. Thank you so much. It's been it's been a huge honor. and i really uh, cherish my association with muzaffar stories for the very simple reason that you guys are documenting what matters the most about travel and it's it's just an amazing opportunity thank you so much that was yet another great episode of the muzaffar stories if you guys like the show please subscribe to us on itunes or apple podcasts audio boom seven pocket casts castbox stitcher or any other podcasting app available on ios or android Please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We go by the handle The Musafir Stories. Or if it suits you, you could email us at themusafirstories@gmail.com or visit our website at www.themusafirstories.com for more information. All of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode. So here's to more traveling, sharing and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, happy travels and goodbye.